It's a great pleasure now to uh, introduce Roland Mimisevich, who's um, a co-founder and, and chief scientist at a startup called 20BN, which is between Berlin and um, Toronto, focusing on video understanding. Um, Roland was previously a professor at uh, Montreal at the Myla Deep Learning Group and spent some time with Yashua Bengio and uh, Jeff Hinton. So with that, here's your clicker, Roland. Thank you. Good stuff. Thanks, Nathan. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks so much for the invitation. Um, in the interest of time, I'm, gonna jump, I'm going to jump right in. Um, ever since uh, the ImageNet challenge was won with ConfNets and kick-started the deep learning frenzy that we have now, uh, around 2012, uh, images and image processing have become a kind of uh, magnet uh, a magnet that attracts almost all the talent that's available right now, or let's say 80% of the talent, uh, that attracts a huge fraction of the research activity that's going on right now, um, and that attracts a lot of the commercial activity that's going on surrounding AI and so on. And that's a real shame because if you learn to do things in images like uh, recognize what's shown, uh, like a dog or a cat or a or whatnot, uh, or you learn uh, to draw bounding boxes around objects or cats, uh, cats or dogs or tree stumps or pedestrians or cars, um, then that's interesting and it's probably useful for certain use cases. But a network that can do that has no, absolutely no clue of what's really shown in the image and what the scene is actually about and so on. Um, so for example, a network that can do something like this, tell you that there's a cat over here or something like that, uh, doesn't actually know what a cat is. Uh, for it, a cat is something like a statistical pattern of uh, edges and colors and so on. It's basically a texture. It's basically a texture recognition thing. Um, it doesn't know that the cat is three-dimensional. It doesn't know that it's surrounded by air. It doesn't know that if it would be floating above the tree stump, then that would be weird. It doesn't know that if the cat jumps behind the tree stump, that it's still there, even though it's not visible. It doesn't know that... Uh, uh, that the cat can't just teleport from one place in this part of the world to another, uh, and so, so on and so on and so on. So um, it's deceptive to think that just by being able to draw a bounding box and say cat, the network actually has any clue of what it's talking about or, or what it actually knows about the world. Um, and that's symptomatic of images. Images just can't tell you that information. Um, humans learn that by playing around with the world and usually observing the world while they do so. Um, and um, we have a real good chance to enable systems, AI systems, to get much more information out of images and out of videos and so on um, by using the right training domain, the right kind of data and the right kind of task. Um, so what we're missing out, uh, out on uh, right now is the ability to understand very simple situations like uh, video on or what was the keyword? Um, uh, like somebody just entering the room or something like that, right? So it's, it's, uh, it's probably easy to draw a bounding box about, uh, around doors and, and detect that they're open or something like that. But this is a completely trivial, easy task for humans and it's very hard to do if you don't have any capability or any understanding of what, uh, what the world actually functions like, what it looks like, that a person can be behind the door first and then af after a while it can, the person can be in front of the door, which means the person walks through the door and so on and so forth. Um, so obviously video understanding tasks would be much better off if we had video data available to train them on, but also image understanding tasks uh, would be much better off if we had uh, video data available to train systems on. And so I would hypothesize that in a couple of years from now, every image recognition system, no matter where it's doing its job, in cars or whatever, is actually a system that was trained on video and not on images. Um, so that it can actually process the incoming pixels uh, much more like humans would do um, and actually see the things the way humans see them. Um, And it goes much further than that. Um, I would even assume that in a few years from now, most NLP systems that do machine translation or something like that will be systems that actually use video data in order to at least learn part of their policy of whatever they have to do, translate sentences or something like that. Um, Vinograd schemas are sort of like a, a modern version of a Turing test that try to test or to assess how good a network is 
at uh, understanding a sentence, and uh, they go something like this. this. The trophy did not fit in the suitcase because it was too big. Uh, and then the question that you have to answer in order to prove your common sense understanding of the world is what is it? What does it refer to here? Um, there's no way you can possibly systematically answer these kinds of questions unless you have some kind of grounding and you know what a trophy is, you know what a suitcase is, you know that things don't fit into one another if one of them is bigger than the other and these kind of things. Um, and none of this information can possibly come out of language, obviously. Um, and I would argue it also cannot come out of uh, images because uh, you don't see how an object doesn't fit into another or something like that. Um, so all of this has been pretty clear to, uh, to a lot of us for many years and we have been doing video understanding and, and uh, driven partly by this observation hoping that one day it will take off and so on. But somehow it never took off um, and What's even weirder about this is that not only is this the right thing to do, you should not start with images in order to do AI, you should start with videos as a seed from which you develop AI. Even though this is completely obvious to me and to many of my colleagues, there's also a gigantic uh, set of use cases that just can't be addressed right now seriously because of the lack of uh, research activity in that space. So everybody does their bounding boxes and pixel labeling systems. Um, and so we're missing out on solving surveillance cases, understanding that somebody just left an object here and walked away, or that somebody just picked up an object and walked away with the object, or uh, that somebody is no longer present and you should call someone to, to look for that person or whatnot. Um, cars need video input to understand that a pedestrian is about, about to fall on the street. Uh, there's uh, drones flying around that would be much better off being able to see where they are flying and so on. Um, contextual advertising, the, the, the internet is kind of moving towards video, Facebook is chasing Snap and everybody just uses the camera as a, as a kind of keyboard now to just send around video messages and so on and so forth. So it's clear from a research perspective, video has to be the starting point of anything you do if you really care about AI and don't want to solve little niche problems. It's clear from a commercial point of view that video uh, is a huge deal and any progress you can make there will be a huge deal and will have a huge impact. And yet the community just doesn't get kickstarted. It's just, it, there's an ignition missing uh, in some sense. So we have been wondering, lots of us have been wondering for a long time why that is. And uh, I think the obvious answer, a part of the obvious answer is that there is no ImageNet for video available. And ImageNet did a lot uh, towards motivating people to try out networks and architectures and get really good at it and so on. Um, so that makes you wonder why is there no such data available? Why, why is there just no video data available? Um, and uh, there are some. Uh, there's uh, video to text challenges and there's uh, action recognition and so on, but they are really weird in many respects in that they are usually very long videos. Um, that have a single label attached to it, so, uh, or a single caption. Uh, so you see like a sports game and then in the end it just says this game, this this team won or whatnot. Uh, sports is a lot, uh, there's a lot of sports in these data sets because you can easily get sports videos from the web and so on. Um, and the, the things that we would like to have, uh, seeing that an object just gets carried away or that an object is just now behind another object and you could, have, you could ask the question, is it still there? The network has to answer it or something like this, just doesn't exist. So I think the, the main reason for why this data doesn't exist and nobody has been bothering uh, uh, getting their hands at this data is that the way that people gather data for AI is sort of the wrong way around. So in order to get data for tasks like ImageNet challenge, uh, video, uh, sorry, image recognition and so on, People go to the web, gather images or either data items, texts or something, and then they uh, assemble a huge database of such items and then they pass those items to crowd workers and the crowd workers are asked to attach labels to those items. And then you have a database, that's a label database and you can do prediction. It's gonna be very, very hard to look through YouTube videos to find a person putting an object behind another object or uh, doing something that you think will teach the network like a baby would learn about the world, uh, an object falling down, not falling up, and these things. Um, and so what we think, uh, and uh, my, 
the company I'm working with is, uh, has been sort of built around this hypothesis over the last couple of months, is that if you just turn this process upside down, um, and we are not the only ones who went down that route, um, we can actually get data that is useful and that will enable us to train systems on, on really subtle motion patterns and so on. So we, we do the exact opposite. We, we make crowdsourcing generative. And uh, so instead of by starting with a label and then getting, uh, sorry, instead of by starting with an item and getting a label attached to that, we start with the labels and then getting videos from crowd workers uh, that reflect that label. So we, gener we create a very large database of labels, descriptions. This can either be textual, uh, somebody is throwing an object on the floor or something like that, uh, or it can be an example video, uh, somebody doing a funny hand motion or something like that, things that you can't even put in words. Um, and so then we ship these off to crowd workers and the crowd workers are asked to record videos for us that show the stuff that we're telling them and uh, they send back the videos. Um, this initially started as a, as a working hypothesis, so we started to try that a little bit with a Mechanical Turk and so on, and it turned out that it doesn't work at all. Uh, and we tried, we called other crowdsourcing uh, providers and it just didn't scale. Um, and uh, the reason is that uh, you have to incentivize, uh, incentivize workers. Uh, first of all, to actually film for you. And if they have to film a video for you and then uh, send it to their computer and then cut it up uh, so that it's the right format and whatnot and recode it and stuff and then send it to you, then it's gonna cost a lot of time. And so uh, we had to add a lot of tricks to make this more convenient for the crowd workers. For example, by doing submissions in batches where labels that are closely related to one another can be just quickly done by them in sequence or by doing on the fly recording where the crowd worker gets a countdown, three, two, one, zero, and then uh, and he or she has to just do this thing that we're asking them and then we just take the video and ship it off to curation uh, and various other tricks like that. Um, so we ended up building this pretty substantial platform that scales up this crowd acting operation and actually makes it scalable for us. And um, that had wor has worked pretty nicely. So we accumulated a pretty nice and substantial database already of uh, video clips, which are typically between three and 10 seconds long. And uh, the videos show stuff that people do. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the data uh, in, a, in a few moments. Um, there are a few tricks. Um, so every time we added a trick, uh, batching or finding the right batch size or something like that, uh, we saw that the rate goes up. Um, we are about to uh, um, uh, turn on another kind of component of this platform that allows crowd workers to not only record the videos and send them to us, and then get them to our own curators, which say whether the videos are good or not, um, but actually allows other crowd workers to then uh, vote on how good these videos are and uh, do the curation basically in the crowd as well. And that uh, we expect is going to add another uh, uh, increase to the, to the rate. And so we expect to be at a million videos in, in a few months and then just go further from there. Um, So I would like to take this opportunity also to point out that last week we uh, released a snapshot of this data that we crowdsourced to the, to the research community. Uh, so you can just download that data now um, off our website. Um, it's about, I think, 250,000 videos in total across two classes of task. Mm. One, the one of them is called something something. And that is a task uh, that really gets at learning these common sense aspects about the world uh, by watching people do, do them. Um, we call it something something because we uh, base this data on captions. So we, we, start off labels, we start off with labels that are defined as sentences. And uh, in order to increase the set of labels we can get from that, that's, these captions are templated. So uh, usually they have something like the word something in there, like dropping something behind something or so. And crowd workers then record the videos for us and tell us what the something was. And so if the crowd worker happens to have an apple lying around, then they're just gonna use the apple and stuff. And so this also plays into making it easy and, and fast and efficient and cost effective. Um, and when we, tried this, uh, when we started to train networks on this initially, uh, you try captioning or something, then the network just said something, something. And so then we decided, okay, let's just call the data set something, something. Um, 
the, the task is made artificially difficult uh, in order to avoid data set bias. Um, so for example, if you only have the class dropping something or picking something up, for example, then it's easy to cheat by just seeing that hand color occurs on the right upper side of the screen or something. And so then the network can just cheat and say, okay, this must have been the picking up motion, even though it still has to fill in the objects. Um, so in order to avoid that bias, we, we added difficult classes like pr uh, pretending classes, for example. So uh, many of these classes, like picking something up, are accompanied by a, a pretending to pick something up class, which would go something like this. So I, I approach the object and I just leave it where it is rather than taking it. So picking the object up is this, pretending to pick the object up is this. And uh, many of these classes have these pairings with pretending or groupings with very similar subtle uh, uh, distinctions like uh, putting something in front of something, behind something, next to something, on top of something, etc. So the task is very, very hard. Uh, if you just train networks, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the architectures in a second, on uh, the basic set of these templates, out of which there are 174 right now, uh, we get something between 10 and 20 percent recognition accuracy. Um, so we started to also reduce the set by um, putting together multiple classes, making the task easier and so on. And so if we reduce it to something like 40 classes, we get uh, about, uh, I think, 25% accuracy. And if we reduce it further to, to 10 classes, which is sort of our version of the CIFAR 10 data set, then uh, we are now at something like 50% top one accuracy. Um, top one accuracy is a bit hard here because uh, there's a lot of ambiguities in these labels, similar to ImageNet. So it's better maybe to look at top two or top five or something. Um, so, but we're starting that we are getting something to work and uh, just like with ImageNet and with basically every single deep learning task that had any impact at all in the past, um, we feel like we have to start with something that's outrageously hard. Uh, and I would start to get worried if we had seen 90% recognition accuracy on this task right away because then it just means there, there's something not really quite meaningful about the data. So I'm hopeful that after this release and the community working on it and so on, uh, we're jointly just going to push this envelope up and, um, and see how far we can get with this. Um, there's another data set. So the second half of the data set is uh, what we ended up calling the Jester database um, that contains human hand gestures. I think it's by far the largest database of its kind. Um, if you could start the video. Um, and its purpose is simply to train networks to understand hand motions, hand gestures. Uh, here you see an example of a subset of eight gestures uh, that are kind of meaningful to people and interesting uh, for potential commercial applications and where the network does a pretty good job at, at doing recognition. What's notable about this is that um, before we went down this route and got this data, a lot of people just said you are out of your mind and uh, you're trying to do gesture recognition with RGB cameras. This doesn't make any sense. Um, it is, has been established for a long time in the community that uh, in order to do gesture recognition, you need depth sensors, time of flight cameras or something like this. Uh, and there's the Microsoft Connect and so on and people are using that in order to see poses of people and stuff. Um, but it turns out it's not at all true. Uh, it just works perfectly fine if you just have enough data. Um, I'm going to keep this running a little bit. In total, the data set that we're releasing has 27 different classes, including a no gesture class. And um, we have a demo uh, that runs on a GPU enabled laptop where people can just try it out and uh, it, it just works. It's robust and works. And um, it basically proves wrong the claim that depth sensors uh, are required in order to recognize gestures, unless you want to do that in the total darkness, which uh, maybe some people would want to do. but. Um, that's not what we're going for with this. All right, I think we can turn this off. Um, just a few words, because I'm running out of time, just a few words on the architectures that we've been playing with on this kind of data. Uh, we found after exploring and playing around and so on that unsurprisingly on a lot of the data, 3D convolutions work very well, um, and that means that a 3D convolution is the same as a 2D convolution, except that it's extended through time. So you have a little three-dimensional convolution kernel that you scan across the frames and also scan across 
time in the video. Um, we also found that two stream networks, so-called two stream networks that have both 2D and 3D convolution pieces in their work slightly better, um, or sometimes substantially better. Uh, the main architectures that we've been looking into are architectures that uh, do this 3D convolution on the video, and then they make predictions over time. So they, they make multiple predictions. They, they try to predict what, they, what the class is or what, what the action there is over time again and again. And so that makes it possible that we can run this uh, at test time in real time by uh, just having those predictions accumulate and maybe smoothing them or not smoothing them depending on the, on the task and so on over time um, to have a real-time capable system. Um, all of this is complete end-to-end -end training, so uh, there's no uh, hand, for example, for the gesture case, there's no hand segmenter or uh, no bounding box that we put around hands as a pre-processing step or something. It's just pure end-to-end, -end. it just pixels in and labels out. And with enough data, it's, it works reasonably well, and uh, we kind of nicely saw that as we increased this database from 20,000 to 30,000 to 50,000, and now it's at something like 150,000, I think. Uh, for the gestures, and uh, now it basically just, it's, 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 for us it's a done deal, it's basically a solved problem. Um, of course there's many other kinds of data that you could crowd act this way, um, and uh, we are playing around with various uh, use cases and talking to customers that are interested in getting data and getting models and solving these problems and so on. Um, the one, and this is the last thing I'm going to say, the one uh, domain that we are focusing on mainly right now uh, in within this portfolio of potential use cases is anything that is domestic, which is natural for this kind of platform. A lot of people are doing their stuff at home. And um, it reflects that there seems to be a strong push right now uh, towards companionship of some sort. So people are starting to accept the idea that you have something like an Amazon Echo sitting in your home which can talk to you and uh, and which is some sort of with you there in the room. And uh, so, so far what people do with these kind of things is that they ask how's the weather tomorrow. Um, and we believe that, uh, that this is actually gonna gain much more traction over time. And it's gonna, it might even become the new kind of iPhone or something like that in the future, that people just feel comfortable with having an AI at home. Um, but the, the real uh, interesting use case for us is that it could enable uh, monitoring for people in need, like the elderly. Um, this is a huge pain point for, uh, for society and for a lot of families and so on. And, um, and this is kind of right, how, right now one of the main threats that we're shooting into and trying to figure out uh, to what degree this kind of uh, um, data sets help. All right, so I've been over time for a few minutes, so thank you for your attention. Any questions for Roland? Hi, Lily from Digital Catapult. I was just wondering how many, how much data do you need to train the RGB videos? To uh, um, how much data do we need to do RGB videos on which task specifically? The the gesture. Task? Yeah, just to recognise the gestures. Yeah, so uh, it works pretty well to the degree that I would say it, it, it solved at uh, now 150,000 videos. Um, but obviously it depends on the number of classes and the subtlety of the gestures and, uh, and so on. Um, so there are some really difficult cases like rolling your hand like this or like this and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, maybe for that you need comparably more data like maybe twice as much data as you would need for very simple static things like thumbs up or something like that. Uh, we saw that we start things to take off. Uh, basically, we, we were getting, we were scared initially. We didn't know if it's gonna work. So we started to get comfort that this is actually the right uh, route to go at maybe 30, 40, 50,000 videos when <coughs> we saw, okay, this network really gets it. And we don't have to go down the route of putting in segmentation systems that can recognize hands, first of all, based on hand color and this kind of stuff. So I would say at 50,000, you start to see the light or something <laughs> at, the, at the end of the tunnel. Hi, my name is Juha from IDEO. Uh, have you looked into sign language? Yes, and we have been thinking a lot about sign language. Um, it would be wonderful to have a system that does machine translation from, from language from language to sign language and vice versa. Uh, 
uh, it's a difficult problem. It's a full-fledged translation problem because sign language is, a, is actual language uh, and it uh, depends on, on source language. It can be English, Fr French, or whatever. And it's, an, it's a real language with its own grammar and so on. So it's, uh, it's a very hard task in its own right. Um, it's not clear whether crowd acting sign language will be the right thing to do. It could be. But not everyone is uh, not everyone is convinced that this will actually uh, be be the right thing to do. But it's appealing. Uh, let me put it that way. Um, we have been thinking about it a lot, and uh, <coughs> it's uh, mainly a resource question. Uh, I think it would require a significant team to to do that. Hi, Richard, <coughs> Columbia. Um, how much did it cost to put this? Uh, the gesture or the the other data set together. Um, the upfront cost is gigantic. <laughs> uh, we are a team of eighteen and soon twenty people uh, who are just focused on this one problem, um, and a lot of time and resources and manpower went into the generation of the crowd acting platform, and. Uh, and it took us several months to build that, and I, I think <coughs> this is a this is a, an upfront cost that's that's gigantic. And it's not only the cost of the the platform, but also the fact that this platform uh, would have been completely useless if we hadn't had researchers that asked for data and needed data to train networks on specific tasks. You wouldn't believe what kind of weird, subtle misunderstandings. Uh, people have when they uh, see your task and then try to act it online and stuff like that. And so, uh, and, and, and the ways in which people try to cheat and re send you duplicates or subtle duplicates and, and stuff like that. So that was, that's a, that's a significant cost, obviously. Uh, then having overcome that, it depends on the task. So the, the generation of videos costs, uh, I can only give you very rough numbers, but something between pennies and dollars per video. Yes. Um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I'm Alper from Wally Mental Sweden. Um, in the in the beginning of your talk you said um, just drawing bounding boxes around like cats and dogs doesn't sort of mean that the algorithm actually mm -hmm. knows what a cat is and so right. on. Right. Um, and when, for example, if you think of a human, and I want to teach you my favorite hand sign, I, don't, I only need to show, you, show it to you once, mm -hmm. not 50,000 times. So do you think that, and we needed like video to make things better. So do you think that your, this way of doing it, the algorithm actually knows what a hand gesture is, and it knows that if my hand has like six fingers, it's not a thumbs up, but it's like an alien or whatever. Yes. So <laughs> yes, I deeply believe your that. Previous point, basically. E e um, I'm not sure about how this relates to the bounding boxes and, and the cats, but um, we deeply, deeply believe in transfer learning, and this has been uh, basically launching this whole agenda even. So I, I, and I personally deeply believe that if you train systems on video, the features that you generate from that that will have baked into them some notion of occlusion, 3D-ness, uh, and various other things that you learn, uh, that they are, will be absolutely crucial for, for any kind of AI to, to get further than where it's right now. Um, so, but this goes down at all, goes through all levels, basically. So transfer learning ultimately is the the, the thing, I think. This is, uh, this is also what drives human intelligence. I can't see any other way in which people can get smart uh, other than having a single cortex that solves all kinds of problems at the same time so that you don't have data scarcity, basically. But, um, so this is from a really like, high-level abstract long-term vision. But um, I, even on the gestures, we already saw that if you train a system on a set of gestures and then just train on a small set of different gestures that you want to learn on the fly, uh, that's small, but you have just a few data cases, but, uh, but you still want to solve it, then it actually works better than training from scratch on the small set. So obviously transfer learning applies very tangibly to uh, something uh, like gesture recognition already now. And our goal with this is not to uh, grow a gesture database forever until we have a million gesture videos or something like that, but to cover the space of, uh, of 
basically videos of length three to 10 seconds so densely that you start to see a significant generalization across the data that you actually generated. So you can imagine the gestures uh, in one area, if you do a two dimensional projection using TSNI or something, in one area here, uh, then the something something data that I mentioned uh, where people do similar stuff but with objects it would be somewhere over here. And then uh, we also have a database of human actions where people stand up and walk around and do stuff that might be somewhere over here. And we are filling this space right now ever more densely so that at some point it's just uh, you just generalize and if that really happens to the degree that it happens this is just what you would call common sense in the end because um, that this is the definition of common sense mm -hmm. in my opinion cool well on, on that note let's uh, let's thank Roland